We're going to get started. And welcome to the joint meeting of the Audits and Public Works Committee. I'm joined by Public Works Chair Mr. Buscaino and Mr. Price, who both sit on the Public Works Committee. And I'm joined by Mr. Bernie Parks, who sits with me on the Audits Committee. Mr. Buscaino, would you like to say a few words? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thanks for your uh, leadership and your partnership on, on this important issue. Ultimately, our end goal is to have better streets. And uh, I spent over a year on this issue with our Save Our Streets LA initiative with Councilmember Englander developing uh, um, a Save Our Streets measure. Um, throughout the process of holding hearings, meeting with uh, neighborhood councils, industry leaders, chambers of commerce, transportation, and environmental activists, I've learned uh, a lot about streets. And through that process, we came up with two conclusions. And that's, um, though we're finally at a point where we stopped um, the street network from getting worse, it will take additional revenue um, in order to improve it in, in any reasonable in a, in a reasonable time frame. Secondly, voters have a deep mistrust of of City Hall, and we need to work to get that trust back as it relates to fixing our streets and our overall infrastructure before we ask them that we need additional uh, revenue. So this audit before us provides a great roadmap for restoring that trust. A lot of the findings in the controller's audit, and I want to thank Controller Galpern for his leadership on this, are um, the, the, his audits are addressed our issues that we already identified as problems that need addressing through uh, this committee's original request for a joint CLA CAO report on the SOSLA measure. And um, a lot are new. And for several of these findings, I've already introduced motions that uh, seek to address the recommendations in the audit. These are um, street smart motions that we dropped, I believe, Dennis, what, eight of them? And this committee has already held two hearings on these motions. And I've um, asked that we approach today's hearing in the spirit of cooperation. I know not a lot of folks like um, audits, but I think it holds us all accountable and makes the city um, a, a, better, um, a better city in general. And, and the common purpose to begin to, to restore voters' trust that we're doing everything we can to uh, maximize their tax dollars as, and, and use those tax dollars as, as wisely as possible. So I want to thank uh, Mr. Price and, and thank you, Madam Chair, uh, for um, partnering with us on, on this audit. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before we take item two, uh, Madam Clerk, can we... If there is no objection, I'd like to take up item two um, on the audits agenda on consent. Hearing no objection, you want to read the item into the record, yes, please? please? I'm sorry, the controller has submitted a report relative to a contract amendment with Macias, Dini, and Ocano, LLP. This is to allow the city to pay for two additional audits required for funds administered by the Housing and Community Investment Department. And we need a vote by audits members only, which will be Ms. Martinez and Mr. Parks. See no objection. We're going to move that forward to consent. Thank you. Thank you. And Madam Clerk, can you read item one into the record, please? On item one, the controller has submitted two reports uh, relative to the audit of the Bureau's resurfacing and maintenance activities. Uh, this is for Bureau of Street Services. Thank you, Mr. City Controller. Are you ready, Mr. Galpin? Our city controller is here to give us a presentation on the audit. Good morning, good afternoon, rather. Uh, and uh, let me also uh, invite, if I may, our uh, head of auditing, which is uh, Fareed Safar, as well as uh, Ed Lorena, who is one of our uh, auditors and had worked on this audit, if I may. Thank you. Do we need another chair? Or? Oh. Good afternoon, uh, committee chairs Martinez and Buscaino. Council members, thank you so much for uh, having us here today and for your uh, collective work on this vital issue. The only issue I have to take uh, uh, with you is you said people don't like audits? What do you mean? <laughs> um, Accountability. <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so very much for all the great work that all of you have been doing on this. Um, there's no question that a, a significant number of the streets that we have in the city of LA, 
of LA are severely damaged uh, and in desperate need of repair, not to mention, of course, all of the ongoing maintenance that is required. Uh, it's a fact that's been discussed and debated. Uh, it's well documented. And the question before us today and before you today is what to do about it. Now, in July of last year, my office performed an audit of the Bureau of Street Services resurfacing and maintenance activities. The audit entitled, Ellie Streets, The Road to the Future, is a comprehensive look at the Bureau's pavement preservation program and provides a series of recommendations that I believe will help put our city on the road to, pardon the pun, a better road for maintenance and repair of our public streets. Some of the audit's major findings include... While the Bureau of Street Services generally met its annual performance goal for street preservation activities, in many ways it was in a triage mode, focusing on B and C streets, and the accumulated weight of the deferred maintenance has really contributed to the poor quality of the other streets that they did not really have the funds or the ability to get to. Next, the Bureau, we talk about the prioritization of repair work based on traffic volume and based on goods movement. And again, I really want to thank very much uh, the Bureau of Street Services for, for all the work that they've done since this audit and also, of course, the uh, uh, Public Works uh, Board as well. But one of the things that we, we focused on that we believe deserves a little bit more looking into is how do we really prioritize based on uh, that traffic volume? And how do we make that much more important in terms of how we choose where we put our money? Um, the city also has a, a rare opportunity, and I know that there's a great interest uh, among the uh, council members here, to modernize a key infrastructure asset. And that's known as uh, the Asphalt Plant One, which has been part of city paving activities for decades and decades. Uh, the city has not made the capital investments necessary to upgrade this asphalt plant and to take advantage of modern asphalt production techniques. And we make a recommendation in terms of how we can perhaps find the finances or a strategic financial partnership that could help achieve long-term environmental and cost benefits, including potential revenue-generating opportunities. Now, there's one particular area that I particularly want to highlight, and that is the Street Damage Restoration Fee, or SDRF. Uh, because this is where we have great potential, I think, to create some more revenues for the city. SDRF is intended to recover the short and long-term repair costs associated with street cuts by utility or construction companies, as you know. And while we don't want to make utility repairs cost prohibitive, the city has not achieved full cost recovery through this fee since its inception. Certain entities, notably the gas company, have also been made exempt from paying the fee since its inception. And, as you know, there is discussion about changing that. Additionally, the city does not always collect SDRF on streets that we consider past their so-called useful life. In many cases, streets that are past what might be considered their useful life are still used every day by thousands, tens of thousands of Angelinos, and our SDRF collections should and I believe must reflect that. Right now, the useful life is 25 years for a residential street, 15 years for non-residential streets, and as we know, there are non-residential streets particularly that have been around for well more than 15 years in their, in their current condition, so they are, they are continuing to have a useful life. And adjusting the fee structure to reflect the true costs of these types of cuts to the CPI or a similar metric can bring in millions to the city to ensure that we fully recover the costs now and in the future and have the money that we so desperately need to do repairs. Um, we also talk a little bit about uh, technology in this audit and what partnerships we might be able to have in terms of better monitoring our streets and their quality. We mentioned, among others, the possibility of something like a Google imaging uh, that could be uh, linked with uh, the type of technology that we already have. And uh, as, as we review these today, uh, again, I want to very much thank uh, the Board of Public Works and particularly President Kevin James uh, for uh, the progress that has been made, for their help, for their cooperation, uh, and also uh, of our uh, Mayor Garcetti. And uh, to acknowledge that the Bureau of Street Services, while we have a lot of things that we note that they could do better, but they also operated and operate under exceedingly tight constraints uh, during some of the toughest of economic times. And they have, I think, really been working very hard to address a number of the issues that we laid out in this audit. 
Uh, the progress is a testament to the power and importance of not being afraid to take a hard look at ourselves, and uh, also with elected leaders and departments working together toward a common goal. Uh, in closing, I want to very much thank my auditing team for their great work, Bureau of Street Services, Board of Public Works, and uh, we are here to uh, answer any questions that you might have. And again, thank you so much for your uh, attention and hard work on this issue. Thank you, Mr. Controller. Are there any questions of our City Controller? If not, I will have uh, Mr. Salceda come and give his presentations of the findings. Is that okay? With yep. Thank you very much. Thank you so very much. Thank you, and thank you to your team. Thank you. And we will have Nazario Salceda come up, General Manager of Suite Services. I also want to recognize uh, the Public Works Commission President, Mr. Kevin James. Thank you for being here. I don't know if you want to say a few words. You're good? Okay. Well, thank you. Mr. Salcedo, whenever you're ready. Oh, thank you very much, Council Members. First and foremost, I want to thank you, Council Members, for the opportunity to address this very important audit. And I want to recognize the partnership, the collaboration between the Bureau of Street Services and the Controller's Office. Um, um, uh, Controller Galperin just listed some of the great things, some of the great opportunities that can come up from this audit, and we're very supportive of, of his ideas and the way that uh, collectively we can make our street network better. Without a doubt, streets are one of the most important elements of our public works infrastructure, simply because they are an avenue to improve safety, economic development, job creation, and quality of life in our neighborhoods. We certainly appreciate the findings and recommendations reflected in the audit report. Uh, we take them very seriously, and we welcome the opportunity to improve and become even more efficient. As a matter of fact, some of the recommendations made in the report have already been partially implemented. But like in every other audit, as you will know, there are findings and recommendations that require a more robust conversation. Um, because sometimes auditors and agencies being audited do not always agree on the views of the matters being audited. I want to commence our audit response uh, by mentioning some very important facts that require a special emphasis because they are extremely valuable in providing a full spectrum of the response that we're about to provide. In terms of LA's street network, LA holds the largest municipal street network in the nation and arguably in the world. There are approximately 28,000 lane miles of streets in LA, the equivalent to a 10 lane freeway between the cities of New York and Los Angeles. The Bureau has been extremely successful in maintaining the city's average pavement condition index of 62 in the last eight years. The poor condition of some streets in the street network is the result, as mentioned by the controller, um, of decades of chronic underfunding or deferred maintenance. The audit report did not state that for eight years now, the BSS has successfully stopped the percentage of streets in poor condition from increasing. Uh, in addition, um, the report did not acknowledge that the BSS has consistently provided elected officials with the necessary technical support and recommendations through the 2005, 2008, and 2011 versions of the State of the Streets reports. The funding needs proposed by BSS to improve the city street network were recently validated by the Harris Report in 2013 as part of the Save Our Streets LA effort. In terms of current resources, current resources, um, BSS lost 40% of its authorized regular positions in the last five years. That is, we went from having 16 resurfacing crews to only having eight. We went from having 25 pothole trucks to having 12 in a good day. However, let me say, council members, that today we are completing more miles and we're doing it more efficiently than five years ago. As a result of the city's hiring freeze, over 55% of the pavement preservation employees have performed their duties in an acting capacity. Their commendable dedication to service is also saving LA taxpayers millions of dollars per year. 
In our pavement preservation activities, labor is not the most expensive variable of the cost of the project. Material cost is. That is consistent with the industry. One thing that makes LA unique is that unlike the majority of the municipalities in the nation, the Bureau uses in-house staff to coordinate our projects with over 200 utility companies to submit letters to residents 30 days in advance and to distribute notices of street work a week in advance. The BSS also manages two very old municipal asphalt plants using city forces. In terms of pavement management, the BSS fully adopted micropaver in 1998. LA was the first large municipality to do so. Prior audits supported the full implementation of the state-of-the-art pavement management system. It takes the Bureau of Street Services three years to complete a full assessment of LA's street network. Other major cities like San Diego take four to seven years to complete, complete their assessments. Best pavement management practices indicate that cities should have an optimum grade condition of B for their streets. Um, this is an industry goal. This is not a goal created by the Bureau. The, Bureau, the Bureau's budget allocation typically assign approximately 90% of its funding to perform resurfacing work and 10% to perform slurry sealing. Now, in terms of transparency and accountability, since 2005, the Bureau publishes the city's state of the streets every three years. No other major city in the nation provide their residents with such a comprehensive assessment of their street network every three years. BSS also provides residents with interactive maps that depict pavement condition of the approximately 70,000 city blocks. LA is the first large municipality in the nation that provided its residents with this level of pavement condition transparency. BSS also makes available on its website information such as scheduled projects, completed projects, condition of streets, and numerous articles published by the Bureau. In terms of accomplishments, LA was the first major municipality that adopted a street damage restoration fee ordinance to protect the city's investment against utility trenching. BSS was a key component of the study that justified the fees. Since the, light, since the late 80s and early 90s, BSS has been the leader in the nation in asphalt recycling. In the last three fiscal years alone, the Bureau produced over 600,000 tons of recycled asphalt, saving LA taxpayers over $12 million. In the last three years, the Bureau's Pavement Preservation Program received awards from the from the Asphalt Recycling and Reclaiming Association and from the magazine Roads and Bridges. These are two of the most prestigious institutions in our industry. These awards came after the U.S. Federal Highway Administration awarded the Bureau of Street Services with the Environmental Excellence Award for the use of rubberized slurry seal, which allows the Bureau of Street Services to recycle over 100,000 waste tires per year. Now, I would like to start addressing the audit by providing to you an executive summary of the Bureau's position on some of the items that require more conversations. Subsequently, my staff and I will be answering your questions in detail. The audit report suggests that BSS performs slurry sealing as an inexpensive substitute for needed resurfacing. Uh, we disagree with that statement. In fact, BSS typically assigns 90% of its pavement preservation funding to resurface streets and only 10% to slurry seal streets. The report also suggests that the BSS does not use common sense criteria such as traffic volume, heavy vehicle loads, and mass transit loads in prioritizing streets. The Bureau disagrees, um, simply because 
the Bureau utilizes the industry-leading micropaver software to identify the most cost-effective maintenance and rehabilitation work for both residential and major streets. Prior audits supported the full implementation of micropaver for this purpose, that is, for the proper selection of streets to be resurfaced and slurry. Furthermore, the BSS incorporates traffic volume and vehicle loads in its budget allocation formula. Moreover, the allocation ratio utilized by the Bureau is consistent with the city's residential streets versus arterial streets ratio. That is, typically 40% of the resurfacing budget is dedicated to arterial streets because arterial streets represent 40% of the street network. The report states that despite the slurry work that is taking place, some of the city's busiest streets remain in the worst condition. Well, we couldn't comprehend this statement completely. Um, slurry seal is used to preserve good streets in good condition, right? And we typically use slurry on streets, residential streets that are in good condition to extend that good condition for the next seven years. So slurry is never applied to streets in the worst condition. So we, we didn't fully comprehend that statement That's in the report. Right? That would be a complete reconstruct. Right. right. Yeah. The report also claims that BSS undercollected $190 million in fees from utility companies that excavate our streets. Um, we don't agree with this statement in more than one way. First, the Bureau is not responsible for the collection of such fees. It was explained to the, um, to the group that BOE is the agency that collects the fees associated with the street damage restoration ordinance. Um, I know for a fact that, that uh, there was a meeting between the auditors, BOE, and contract administration. So again, to make the BSS responsible for an alleged lack of collection is not a, 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 a statement we agree with. Uh, in fact, uh, the Department of Public Works through the Bureau of Engineering has accurately collected the fees that were originally set by the mayor and council in 1998 and adjusted by policymakers in 2006. Um, the alleged $190 million of undercollected fees is basically a hypothetical number based on a situation that never transpired. Um, the $190 million was estimated assuming that the city had to adopt a full recovery fee that in reality was never accepted or approved by your predecessors. The original intent of the uh, ordinance in 1998 was to create a fee to motivate and enhance coordination between utility companies and the city with the purpose of protecting newly paved streets from being excavated. Lastly, um, the other report also claims that the BSS returned $21 million of unused pavement preservation funds to the city, when in fact the majority of these funds were reprogrammed during the fiscal year by policymakers and the CAO due to the fiscal pressures of the general fund during the budget crisis. For example, from the alleged $21 million, $5.6 million were transferred to GSD so they could provide the Bureau with equipment maintenance and material testing support. Uh, 7.4 million were utilized to reimburse the general fund for our resurfacing related costs. Um, 3.6 million of proxy funding were reprogrammed for street improvement projects related to Metro as well as for streetscape and bikeway projects. And the rest of the money was reprogrammed as well. In essence, council members, um, the BSS completed its budgeted goals. Now, um, we are ready for your questions. If you have any questions, council members, my staff and myself are available to answer. Thank you very much, Mr. Salcedo. Mr. Buscaino, would you like to start or I can go down? I'm sure. I have several questions. Yeah, I, I think I have questions on pretty much every finding, so. Okay. Um, thank you, Mr. Salcedo, to you and your entire team, um, Ron Olive as well for being responsive uh, to uh, Mr. Galpern's audit and for your ongoing dedication, not only you, but also the, uh, the street teams across the city of Los Angeles for the hard work 
they put in day in, day out. Um, I know you mentioned the street damage restoration fees and some of those fees uh, feel that they're not being um, collected and it's not ultimately your BSS's responsibility. We, we put in the, the uh, council motion uh, CF 14-1571 that uh, calls on CAO, CLA, BOE, and Bureau of Con, Con Ad to present a cost and fee analysis of supporting this, this restoration fee based on full cost recovery model. Um, a couple questions I had, um, specifically, I just turned to your direction, turned um, to finding number nine um, as it relates to the micro paver. Mm -hmm. Uh, finding indicates the BSS current pavement management system is not integrated with other pavement management databases and city systems, um, et cetera. Um, wouldn't it be useful to have a more comprehensive uh, asset management system that would create an inventory of things like street signs, uh, sidewalks, um, parking meters, uh, medians? Um, if we know that um, this micropaver works for streets, why aren't we uh, taking it a step further and looking at how other, other, other ways we can inventory um, the key infrastructure on the city of Los Angeles? That was a great recommendation made by the, by the, uh, by the, the report, in the, made in the report, um, simply because in reality, uh, an asset management uh, uh, program goes beyond just streets. It, now includes 180 degrees, and that is that includes sidewalk condition, an inventory of trees, an inventory of furniture. It goes beyond the capabilities of micropaver. Uh, needless to say, we have not done that in the Bureau because a lot of the other elements within the public right-of-way do not fall under the purview of the Bureau of Street Services. Some other elements fall under the purview, for example, of street, the Bureau of Street Lighting, right? right. So it would be nice, it would be nice, and I, I, I we're very supportive of that recommendation if the city, you know, um, adopted a, an, an asset management uh, program that not only includes streets, but includes everything. That would be the most ideal situation. So by all means, we're extremely supportive of that, that idea. In our case, we have concentrated on streets because it requires, in order to analyze streets and street condition, you really need to have high definition. For example, we have tried to um, read um, um, distresses from Google, from using Google, and Google doesn't provide high definition, um, uh, like the existing system uh, available um, um, to, the, to the public doesn't provide the level of accuracy that we need in order to analyze distresses. But I'm sure we can, you know, work with these companies to try to come up with a plan in which, you know, we get more, more definition in order to, for us to perform the work, yes. You also mentioned and you, um, you argued and disagreed with the report on how the worst streets in the city are not being addressed as, as it relates to different maintenance. Um, but at the same time, wouldn't you, don't you agree that we need a policy of prioritizing the streets that carry the most traffic um, after we ensure the overall network PCI remains stable? That, that is correct. You, you hit the, the nail right on the head. Uh, right after we make sure that we have enough work to at least secure that the pavement condition of the city will not decrease, by all means, we can um, uh, focus our attention on arterial streets. Let, let me simplify what I just said. The city needs to perform 2,000 lane miles of street work every single year in order to maintain the current average condition of the city. That is 100 lane miles of resurfacing and 1,200 lane miles of slurry. I support the idea of putting more money on arterial streets right after we go beyond that limit of 2,000 lane miles. At that point, by all means, if we have funding for 2,200 lane miles or 2,400 lane miles, we fully support the idea of putting major emphasis on transportation corridors. This is, this is a great idea, and by all means, policymakers like yourselves need to set that specific uh, goal. Um, and I was, refer I was referring to findings number 12 and 16. Um, look at finding number 19. Um, how does the Bureau address extending utility holds moving forward? Uh, finding number 19 indicates utility holds can um, 
indefinitely delay planned street resurfacing? Well, you know, uh, in 1998, and, and, and I say this because I was part of the team in 1998 that worked very hard to um, implement the street damage restoration fee ordinance. Um, in 1998, uh, the main goal was to protect the city's investment, right? But in reality, by doing that, um, we created another layer in which us, we don't have the ability, the city that just doesn't have the ability to pave streets, you know, um, uh, freely. No, we need to go through a very rigorous process in which we have to coordinate with over 200 utility companies. And utility companies, understandably, they have their projects as well. So. The, the level of communication that exists today between utility companies and the city of LA is magnificent. I, I cannot complain about the way we communicate with all of them. The city also adopted a public works reservation system in which at any given time, cities, residents, businesses can determine what's coming in, in a certain segment of the street in terms of projects. So, um, yes, it is critical right now to um, to enforce or reinforce um, reinforce um, the um, the, uh, the coordination among utility companies and the city of LA from this point on, especially if there's going to be an effort to address the streets in worse conditions. Thank you for that. And lastly, um, if I can direct your attention to finding number 11 as it relates to the type of new materials that's presented to us, equipment, technology. Um, this was a key finding, and, and let me be clear that um, although I said people are afraid of audits, they don't like them, but again, it makes us stronger, right, controller? Makes us a better city um, and it holds us all accountable. And this one, I feel, uh, was alarming to know that back in 2000, we had um, um, a specialized pothole killer technology mm -hmm. that was put in, into operation, but uh, was discontinued, um, even though it was highly efficient. and. Can you explain the process of evaluating new products when a vendor approaches a bureau? As members of the city council, we are afforded the opportunity every fall uh, to attend the California League of Cities and also National League of Cities conference. And they have a number of these vendors that they present themselves uh, to finding ways to um, look at efficiencies as it relates to fixing our streets. Um, what is the process of evaluating new products um, when a vendor approaches us? I can answer that. Uh, I'm Greg Spots. I'm the division manager for Methods and Standards. And my division is often the first stop when vendors come to us and are, have a new product they'd like us to evaluate. Um, we meet with everybody who wants to meet. Uh, usually uh, what we recommend to them is to submit a sample of the product for testing by the General Services Division uh, Standards Lab. Because um, many of these products, they have to meet all different kinds of regulations as far as the skid resistance and other things to see if it's even safe to put in the public right of way. So a lot of times uh, these companies decide not to avail themselves of that testing, but sometimes they do provide uh, products to test. And of the subset of the products that pass the tests, then we can evaluate whether or not uh, they perform well for us. Um, you know, we would love to have a dedicated research and development unit to more proactively develop products. However, we are proactively developing cool slurry right now. You know, um, we know the council is very interested in cool pavements to reduce the heat island effect, and my group is leading an effort to try to stimulate vendors to produce a product that doesn't currently exist that meets all the standards for the public streets. Because today, those light-colored coatings are only used in off-street parking lots and other places because above 25 miles an hour, they're too slippery in the wet. Got it. Um, I do want to also just say something about the pothole killer. Uh, we've, our professional judgment is that the pothole killer is not designed for a warm climate such as this. Most of the uses of pothole killer, it, pothole killer is a truck where one person can sit in the cab and manipulate a a, a large hose with a nozzle at the end that can spray a very fine asphalt mix into the pothole and it doesn't get compacted. And you know that if asphalt isn't compacted by us, it gets compacted by traffic and becomes another depression. So the pothole killer's best application is in a state like Wisconsin in the dead of winter where it's dangerous to put people out on an icy or snowy street and so you keep them in the cab, you spray that uncompacted repair in and then you come back in the springtime 
and do the proper type of compact repair that we're doing every day. I see. So, you know, we, we leased one of those machines. We tried it. It needed a special asphalt we had to go to Corona to get because it has to be so fine to fit through that little nozzle. Mm -hmm. um, we felt that the repair wouldn't stay very long because it's not compacted. And that the way we currently do potholes where we use a vibratory plate, right. you've seen it, it looks like a lawnmower. I've done it myself. Mm -hmm. I've yes, I, I might have even been there when you've done it. Right. Um, uh, we find that the way we're doing it now produces a, a repair that's going to last three to four times longer. And so it's actually more efficient to have a two-man crew do that compacted repair than have a one-man guy uh, do that very short-term repair. So the controller recommends um, an R&D staff member. Um, have, uh, do we anticipate requesting this pers this person out this person up this position in BSS in this next fiscal cycle? Well, that's, that was one of the, uh, the, um, the uh, recommendations that we made. Basically, what we want to do, we want to put together, um, two years ago, I created the methods and standards um, a division precisely to make sure that every protocol and every, and everything that we do within the Bureau is as efficient as possible. Greg has done a magnificent job, you know, um, 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 overseeing this, this division, but his division is basically empty. It's an army of one, you know, if we, and a clerical and clerical staff. So one of the things we're that form a unit. Yes, we're, we're going to form a unit right now. Now that our hiring plan has been approved, we plan to um, um, hire some individuals so so we can uh, fortify his division and start working on a research team along with our friends in general services, because general services is always invited. The material testing lab is always one of our partners and also fleet services. If we're going to purchase a piece of equipment, we want to make sure that GSD will be okay with it because they ultimately they will be maintaining that piece of equipment. So it is, it is, a, it is, it is a partnership among different, different uh, agencies um, that will have to determine if a piece of equipment is good enough for the city or not. Appreciate your uh, responses and uh, look forward to continuing this, uh, this effort and uh, improving our efficiencies in the City of Los Angeles through our committee, the Public Works. And, you know, streets should be a sexy issue around the City of Los Angeles because um, we see it, we feel the issues we, we, as we drive and we know the number of potholes, one of the top calls that constituent service calls that we get in our respective council offices. And, I look forward to moving, um, moving on these key initiatives um, to improve our infrastructure across the city of Los Angeles. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you. I have a couple of questions. So I, I'm going to go to finding number two. Mm -hmm. uh, will BSS be able to include the other maintenance activities as part of the uh, unit? cost analysis? Uh, yes, we will. Um, we uh, are currently doing a unit cost analysis for slurry seal separately from resurfacing. Uh, slurry seal, we have one master work order for the whole program, which was a recommendation that uh, the controller had. Uh, for resurfacing, we have a separate work order for each resurfacing project. And the way we've piloted it, and it's working out very nicely, is we, we ran um, you know, the unit cost for not just labor, but materials, trucking, equipment, everything, uh, for all the resurfacing segments. And then we were able to total them up and see what it is on average in total and by individual segments. And we're learning a lot from that very granular information that we developed. So we hope uh, to, by the beginning of next fiscal year, be doing this on a quarterly basis for both resurfacing and slurry. And on the same finding, number two, you disagree with the methodology that was proposed by the audit. Is there a methodology that you would prefer to keep track of the information? Yes. Um, the methodology proposed by the audit was limited to only labor cost, and it was more like the kind of metric you'd use in a law firm, where you're saying how many hours are billable versus how many hours are not billable. Um, it, their methodology excluded a lot of our labor activities that support the resurfacing function, like uh, communicating with all the utilities and posting notices, uh, managing the, the contract trucking, et cetera. Um, we've developed a methodology that's comprehensive, that evaluates our labor costs, our asphalt costs, our trucking costs, um, and our equipment costs. So we're able to look at all the variables Asphalt is about 55% of the unit cost, so that's very important to include that. 
Um, so we're now, you know, developing information internally that we can use to manage all the cost drivers, including labor. Okay. And on uh, finding number three, on the necessary upgrade to the asphalt plant, uh, what's the timeline for completion on this? Joe Cruz, Assistant Director of Bureau of Street Services. Uh, our Bureau of Engineering is uh, taking the lead on project management for um, retrofitting of our, our asphalt plant one. Um, currently, they're in uh, preparing designs for bid. Uh, the bid should occur in uh, roughly September of 2015, according to the current schedule. Um, estimated completion from that point, I believe, is uh, a year and a half for, to two years from uh, September 2015. Great news. Yeah, that is. Uh, what's the estimated cost of the replacement or upgrade? Uh, that's something that's still yet to be defined as part of the, the project management uh, that, that our Bureau of Engineering is doing. Is there a joint uh, partnership? Is that a viable option? Could we, could the city effectively uh, partner with another jurisdiction mm, we asked that. on such a project? <laughs> I think that's a, that's a, that's an option, but that's an option that will have to be presented, analyzed by the CAO and the CLA. Um, we don't really know. I mean, I'm sure there are people who w would like to invest in the city of LA and um, and, uh, um, and be part of the investment. But uh, uh, in reality, that wouldn't fall under the jurisdiction of the Bureau of Street Services. That would fall under the jurisdiction of the financial agencies like the CAO and the CLA. Um, um, well, along the same lines, I was thinking, could the city produce asphalt that could then be sold to other uh, that's, government jurisdictions? That is an excellent question, and that's something that we have proposed numerous times. It's a, this is a decision that has to be validated by the city attorney, because apparently, uh, per city chapter, um, uh, per city charter, I'm sorry, um, um, it is it is it is not highly recommended that the city engages in the selling of you know um, asphalt and becomes a competitor against um, private private entities but by all means i mean with the new asphalt plan we would have the capacity not only to perf to produce asphalt for our resurfacing crews but also to provide it to um, um, surrounding cities right are you saying that our city charter prevents us from doing that that, that's, that is our understanding. Per, so is per, the city attorney looking into how we can do it, or is that something we're advising us not to do? I think the prior city attorney advised us not to do it, and it may be time to relook at that. Right. That is a great opportunity because if once this, this new asphalt plant is, is, is operational, we would have enough capacity not only for the Bureau of Street Services, but the other city agencies that use asphalt, the port, uh, Lawa, um, um, the zoo, you name it, the proprietary is DWP. And here's an opportunity to maximize the plant, to maximize recycling, because this will be a 50% recycled asphalt. We wouldn't have piles all over the city, you know, in, in small yards. And this would give us the ability to use this uh, old asphalt uh, in a quicker fashion. So I take it you're going to try to pursue that? That is correct. We will follow up with the city attorney, Councilwoman, and uh, we'll try to get a more definite um, answer. On uh, finding number five on the SDRF, is a, a study being contemplated? Um, and can an appropriate index be used to raise the rates in the interim? Good afternoon, Ron Ollett, Assistant Director of Bureau of Street Services. Uh, yes, we've been working with um, the CAO, Bureau of Engineering, and a number of others, CAO, CLA, um, in a committee chaired by Mr. Gleason here from CD15, a uh, working group, we will, a number on these, of these issues. And yes, we actually have um, a draft report that hopefully we'll be bringing to Public Works Committee next month, and it's got a series of recommendations for a short-term increase in SDRF to target full cost recovery uh, at this time is based on, on actual costs and indexes. But also there's a recommendation to uh, hire the uh, consultant that did the original study back in 96 and to update not only the costs and the, the impacts, but there's a lot of different traffic conditions and, and, and impacts on pavement and new technology out there um, to update that study so that we can have a 
a much more defensible, airtight defensible um, case in, in uh, increasing those fees to achieve full cost recovery. Was 1996 the last time that the SDRF was uh, increased? It was increased one time in 2006. 2006. There was actually a couple of council motions in 2002 and 2004 that contemplated a number of things, increasing the moratorium from one year to 18 months on, on no cutting in streets, increasing the, uh, the, uh, the SDRF rates, um, contemplating a slurry seal moratorium period and looking at fees for cutting into slurry seal streets. So we did, in 2006, we, or excuse me, in 2004, we actually formed a committee with the council office, Bureau of Engineering and ourselves, and reported back on the consensus on you know, no more touring for slurry seal, but we did in, um, um, initiate a, a fee structure, and we did increase the the, uh, the SDR fees for resurfaced streets uh, based on the Caltrans indexes at the time, which we believed were the most appropriate. But again, as, as Nazario mentioned in his opening, in 96, 98, and 2006, it was really never there was never really the appetite, if you will, to achieve full cost recovery. It was really to continue the incentive for utility companies and other agencies to coordinate with us um, so that we wouldn't have the premature cutting of streets. And I think it was evidenced in, in just the year two or three after the ordinance was, was enacted that we saw really a 60, 70 percent decrease in the number of cuts in newly resurfaced streets. So it really achieved its goal at the time. So mm -hmm. now all of a sudden we were, we're shifting focus and we're, we're, achieve, we're, we're looking to achieve full cost recovery. So we're on board to do that. We'll have recommendations back to the Public Works Committee hopefully next month. And currently is uh, BOE collecting the full amount of the SDRF? Yes. It, it's our understanding that they are. It, they're they're oh, going the, over the entire amount? Yes. The rates that were set in 2006, mm -hmm. the last increase, yes. But those rates were not set to achieve full cost recovery. That would be a policy decision for, for the present. And so is there also an, a way where we can evaluate every year or every two years um, to ensure that the department maintains a full cost of recovery? That's another one of the, the recommendations that's going to be part of that same report. Mm -hmm. And actually we have to credit our friends at the sales office who's going to be coming back with that recommendation. Yeah. So it's part of the... Your yes. yes, part of the council member Buscaina's motions, yeah. Mm -hmm. that, that, that report, I think, has f <laughs> five or six aspects to it, looking at uh, truck and, and overload traffic and those impacts, mm -hmm. looking at the best, um, uh, best practices for repairs, a number of those issues are going to be looked at in that particular report. But I understand your frustration, <laughs> um, Madam Chair, I know because it, these, are, uh, these are great questions, and it's, it's the, how many... We need to elevate the report back to action, right? Mm -hmm. And that's what we're hearing. All right. Exactly. I was going to close with that. <laughs> <laughs> it's great to have report backs so when we're actually going to implement action. some of that stuff. Right. On uh, finding number eight. Okay. This one's on. Is there an existing cost accounting program that you would use? Um, to code each activity type? Yes, um, we, we actually have a very robust cost accounting system um, and, and it works in multiple dimensions. It's a relational database so we can look at all the costs associated with a particular street segment, that would be the work order, or we could sort by activity code. So uh, say Elm Street from first to second, there may be five different activity codes for how much we spent to mill off the old asphalt, how much we spent to put down the new asphalt, new curb ramps that we might have installed at the time, um, uh, even if we needed to do tree trimming to allow our equipment to be able to pass. So we have all this information. Um, we are able to um, organize it in multiple different views. And what we've piloted as far as the unit cost analysis I referred to earlier as part of number two is a really a, a rich uh, analysis that we're now going to be doing that will allow the people in the division to have a much better understanding of the cost impacts of their operations. So you wouldn't need a new cost account accounting program? Mm -hmm. No. no. And the other thing, Councilwoman, if I may, um, is, is there, there's a normal um, delay 
to get the actual cost of a project because there's a lot of buildings involved, trucking, purchasing of material, and there's a lot of vendors involved. So it takes, it takes some time. Even when you complete the project today, let's say a resurfacing project on, on one of your streets, Glen Oaks, I mean, still, you know, we need time to capture all the costs. It takes like, what, two months or three months to really have the, the, the cost, the, the full cost of the project in the system because there's, there's billing that has to go through our Office of Accounting. It goes to the controller's office for payment. And, and that process in, in itself takes weeks, if not months sometimes. So, so, but the system is there in place, and we're trying to fine-tune it uh, to the best of our abilities. And um, finding number nine, uh, I had one question on finding number nine. Is, is there, what systems, do, uh, what systems do other cities use, like Long Beach or even the county of Los Angeles, uh, to evaluate their streets? Is there anything, is there best practices that we can use Yes, there? best management practices will tell you that the most sophisticated um, uh, cities use micropaver. Micropaver is used by the U.S. Army, is used by the U.S. Navy, by the Air Force and the Marines, is used by FAA, is used highly recommended by the American Public Works Association. And yes, there are some other pavement management programs. It's not the only one. Uh, there's one called Street Survey, Saver, which is very similar to, uh, 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 to Micropaver. Um, but in our case, in LA, having a system as big as LA is, you know, we need to customize any pavement management system. If, if you were to create, or if, if I go to any store, or if I get a vendor to come here and, pro and propose a, a pavement management system, the first thing that vendor is going to have to do is customize it to the size of LA. Because there's nothing available in the market except micropaver that is ready available for the Bureau of Street Services. We also have you know, a consulting contract with the founder of Micropaver, Dr. Shaheen, and so we're able to get advanced versions of, uh, of the software. We're able to get custom modifications. Sometimes, for example, when we were supporting Save Our Streets, uh, his group would do custom data runs for us to support some of the questions that policymakers have. So we have you know, a, a lot of benefit in using Micropaver because of this close collaboration with the people who publish it. Mm -hmm. Finding, and finding number 16, I don't know if this is going to sound controversial or not, but is there a way for you to prioritize the reconstruction of streets that are in D and F condition every other year and then defer the maintenance on streets that are in fair and good condition? This is the way we operate right now, Councilwoman, and, and I, I can... I can feel your frustration because I feel the same frustration too as a as, as, as a caretaker of the city street network I feel exactly the same way I wish I could address those streets that are in terrible condition but but again here's 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 our dilemma here's our predicament the money that we have today and let's assume let's 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 talk about this fiscal year this fiscal year we're going to complete a historical high of 2400 lane miles of pavement preservation. Even at a, at a historical high, we're only touching 8% of the street network. Right. At a historical high, that's only one in every 12 blocks in LA. So in order for me, it's like having five children and, and one of them, or 15, and, and all, one of them wants to eat steak, well, I cannot spend all my money in steak because then someone else is not going to eat. Everyone is going to have to eat beans and rice, right? And that's the way I keep everyone alive. Well, that's the way we are doing work. Pavement management practices will tell you, do not, if you don't have money to improve F streets, don't invest any money on F streets. But still, the Bureau of Street Services understanding efficiencies uh, we consider F streets when they are part of a grid. Let's say that I go to a grid within your council district, councilwoman, and there's four streets that I'm going to pave, streets in C condition or D condition, and within the grid there's an F. Then, in order to create efficiencies, in order to maximize the equipment moves and all of those things you know, in, involved in the cost, I will consider paving an F street. But if I was to put my money 
on F streets, instead of doing 2,000 lane miles of work, I would be doing probably 150 lane miles of work. I get that question all the time. Yes. Neighborhood watch meetings in terms of why are you even, uh, why are you, you know, repairing the, the fair to good streets? Why don't you take care of the F streets first? Right. It's, it's very right. frustrating. Slurry is, is, again, is applied on streets um, in fair to good condition to maintain them in that condition. I, I, I know it is frustrating, but... Um, 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 well, how about instead of focusing on the citywide average PCI of 62, could you set an annual goal uh, based on the street condition? Um, I, I don't think I, un I fully understand your question, so, Councilwoman. for example... Say you, you do 25% of the work in streets that are in D condition, and you do 25% of the work uh, in streets that are F condition. I'm still trying to get to right. the F streets and the D streets faster because right. they're the ones in dire need that, of repair. That's that, that is an excellent, an excellent um, explanation. And let me tell you that uh, until two years ago, we were considering spending up to 10 or 15 percent of our budget on F streets. But most recently, we were required to complete 2,400 lane miles of streets, which is a tremendous amount of work considering the resources that we lost in the last five years. So performing reconstruction of streets not only is very expensive, but also it is very time consuming because you have to remove the full structure of the street, replace it, and then pave the street, which will not allow us to complete the uh, incredible goal that we're trying to accomplish this year. So we went in, in prior years from using 10 or 15 percent of our budget on F streets to only using approximately 5 percent of our budget this year. Only 5 percent of our budget is dedicated to F streets this year. And that direction was provided to you by? Well, we've been asked to to do 2,400 lane miles for 2,200 lane miles of funding. That was the challenge given to us by the mayor's office a year ago this time. So we have to find the most cost-effective streets to pave of the 22 to free up money to do the other 200. Um, I do want to say, though, that when we publish the new State of the Streets report within the next 90 days, there'll be a finding in there that the percentage of lane miles of residential streets in good condition has substantially increased in the last nine years, which means that we are strategically, when we can, going into residential streets that are in DRF condition, but where the poor, the bad condition is due to the age, not to water infiltrating the base and damaging it, and we are resurfacing some of those. So we are very carefully mining the micropaver data mm -hmm. to find why is it a DRF. If it's got base failure, we can't afford to dig out that base and replace it. But there are some Ds and Fs that simply are very, very old where it's oxidized, and those we can do the old mill and pave that we're doing everywhere else um, and make that street a nice street again. And there is a a non-trivial increase in uh, in the share of residential streets in good condition that we'll be reporting. Thank you. That concludes my questions, Mr. Price. Thank you, Madam, Madam Chair. Uh, I th think that uh, you and uh, Mr. Chair have asked most of the questions I had uh, and, and appreciate the leadership of both of you on this uh, on this important issue. Uh, and the support from the controller in helping us to um, better illuminate what some of the issues are. And, of course, the team from BSS in, in making things happen. Um, certainly no um, more important issue than the quality of the street, streets when you talk about the quality of life. I mean, people will, you know, relate to that, whether they're clean or potholed or whatever. Um, but shifting to finding 14, the city has no moratorium for excavating streets that recently received slurry seal treatment. And... Uh, Again, just kind of re re relate the importance of that. Uh, you talk about a shortfall that's not being uh, collected uh, with that moratorium policy. Uh, how did it come about and how can we correct that? Yeah. Councilman, again, this, this is, I believe this is the, um, the recommendation to increase the one-year moratorium on newly resurfaced streets um, and even look at, uh, re-look again at um, instituting a, a moratorium on slurried streets. 
I, I can tell you also in that working group that we've we've talked about, we are looking at um, at this. Uh, the Bureau of Engineering and the Bureau of Street Services will have a joint report back on this. Uh, we're looking at what a number of other cities are doing. We're looking at the increase, uh, you know, the, the the, the consequences on going too long, you can imagine if, if we're talking a three-year moratorium, there's a lot of uh, proposed development that's out there that may not may change ownership before three years. Um, there's a number of folks that will need a gas hookup or a sewer hookup in three years that they don't even know about yet. So they're not going to be, um, you know, allowed to hook up. But there's, we're looking at, if there's going to be an increase, looking at maybe a number of, um, call it exemptions, hardship exemptions, that maybe there's certain categories that we will allow to cut within that period of time. Maybe it's still a first, uh, a hard first year, but after that, um, the folks that could have planned, the folks that could have coordinated with us, uh, maintaining that, that, that longer uh, moratorium. I think that's what this, this one is about. And again, the slurry seal uh, moratorium we're looking at again. Again, we looked at it back in 2004 with a group, not just with BSS. Um, it, it seemed like it would be unmanageable at that time, but um, we're certainly taking a look at that. And again, that will be one of the report backs we'll be coming back to Public Works with yeah. soon, hopefully next month. Uh, summarizing, Council Member, we did this exercise back in 2004, and at that, at that time, the elected official decided not to exercise or not to apply a moratorium on slurry, on slurry seal. So, uh, but we're coming back with the new recommendations. reading the audit, and I don't know whether it was just from misinformation or whether people that were interviewed were ill-informed, but there's at least, I think, four spots that I found in the audit that identified uh, at least information that was given to the auditor and later was disputed by either the Bureau of Engineering or some other city department in which the controller identified in one of their later comments that maybe the information wasn't as accurate and given as far as it was given. And I'm just wondering, is that do we have any idea who provided the information to the auditors that uh, they had to later come back and, and identify where it may have been inaccurate? The only part of the audit that I know of um, that you might be referring to is there was an inquiry about how the SDRF was originally calculated in 1996 and documentation from that period is not available and so there were some there was some confusion across the different departments as to uh, who did what at you know 20 19 years ago and it was a whole different staff of people here but that's the only one I know of no, no there was one that was very clear about potholes where we're reporting numbers to the mayor's office, but yet there's not documentation to verify it. And oh. it's different from either a monthly or weekly report uh, that is given by the department. And then there is uh, information, I think you commented earlier, about the pop pothole killer. <laughs> You're saying it doesn't work in cold weather or in hot weather, yet the controller's audit says it works in all weathers. I'm mm -hmm. just wondering... <laughs> How do we reconcile some of these? Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, the observation about not having an accurate um, uh, number of particles uh, repaired um, basically came from us not having all of the documentation that the auditors requested. Indeed, you know, we were missing some of the, some of the, uh, the paperwork. Since, of course, we have been able to um, keep better records keep everything in Google documents, no longer paper, you know, every, although the majority of the, of the work is being captured on paper, you know, out there in the streets, that information is entered immediately in, a, in an electronic, in, a, in an electronic file to make sure that is not lost, you know, um, and that's where indeed um, um, we acknowledge that, yes, yeah, some of the numbers 
we couldn't back him up because we just didn't have the paperwork. That is correct. And we're, right now we're working in adopting new technology that luckily as part of the budget, uh, the, uh, the mayor's budget, we are being funded to adopt the technology that will allow us to capture the information right there and then and to enter the information in the system in real time. So now, as we fix the potholes, we'll know exactly, you know, how many we fixed, you know, every single day. Let me ask you a couple of, on, on item four. Uh, it mentions that the audit asked about whether you could contract work out, and the answer back was, is it feasible because design plans would first need to be developed? And then you go to the next paragraph, and BOE says, uh, who is typically responsible, said that that's not so, that they not currently required design plan. And so I'm trying to figure out what, um, item number no, four. That's, that's not on the table. It's, uh, not oh, it's that's oh, that's audit. in the, uh, in the, the audit. Table. Okay, we're not okay. referred to the table. Okay, I'm just looking at. Okay. Can you repeat it again, Councilman? I apologize. On uh, recommendation or finding number four, it says here that the audit suggested that BSS contract for this work. BSS indicated that contracting out would be infeasible because design plans would first need to be developed, and then as you go. Through through the next paragraph. However, DOE, who is typically responsible for design plans, reports that design plans are not required for street maintenance and rehabilitation contracts. I can speak to that. Um, on the specific issue of design plans, Los Angeles County performs full plan sets before they bid out uh, projects. So do the smaller municipalities uh, within the county. Um, there was a one and a half year long design process for the Wilshire paving project that BOE recently managed. Um, BOE has not in many years contracted bread and butter resurfacing, so they may have an opinion on whether or not plan sets might be needed for such contracting, but it hasn't been done in a very long time. And the last time they contracted for a paving project, which is the Wilshire BRT project, Solmus was hired for a year and a half long design process. Okay, so what are we saying? The, the entities within the county that actually currently contracted out are doing using full plan sets. Okay, what about us in the city? We haven't contracted out bread and butter resurfacing in decades. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I think that was the question, is whether the, you have considered going out to contract. The answer was no, because it's infeasible, because you need design plans. He also, oh, he says that's not so. Well, we had other reasons why we didn't agree with that recommendation. I'm, I'm only going to read what's mm -hmm. in here. It says infeasible because of design plans. Well, another reason that we had is that the idea was if we, we have been meeting our goals, but the controller suggested that if there was an occasion where we weren't able to meet our goals, maybe we should contract out the work that we weren't able to do. We haven't been in that situation. But if we were to find ourselves in that situation, we wouldn't find ourselves in that situation until near the end of the fiscal year. And the contracting process can take six to nine months. So we wouldn't have the time, by the time we knew we were short, to contract the work. We, we didn't say it's infeasible to have plan sets. We said it costs money. And those soft costs that other municipalities are uh, experiencing are sometimes 25% of the contracted value. So the cost of creating the plan set, bid and award, managing the contract, uh, collecting, uh, you know, dealing with all the closeout can be 25 to 30 percent on top of the contracted cost. So our feeling was from talking to other municipalities that it would cost the city more than how we do our work today. Councilman, also if I, if I may add to that, I think the context of that finding, if I recall, also was at the end of the year, if we find that we're going to have savings, we've met our goal, but we still have money and we don't want to return it, go ahead and contract out that surplus. Now, as Greg just mentioned, there's no time. At that point, there's no time to, even if we didn't have to do design plans, to identify enough to bid it out and to get to get bids and to award it. There's actually, other departments have been successful at going out to RFP and having businesses on the bid so that they can call on them when you need them. If you wait until you need them and you need an RFP, I can guarantee you, you will not need it. But right. if you do an RFP and you have them available, just like general services has people on their bench when they need a fence, or they need a camera, or they need a security system, they don't go out when they need it. They have them already 
pretty well approved. That's, I think what I thought they were asking is that you have all these options available and can you bring them into play when you meet some form of emergency. So if you have a bunch of money at the end of the year, yes, it's too late to go out to RP. But if you have already approved, and if you don't use them, you don't pay for them. But if you already approved uh, vendors on your bench and you can call them in, then you have the ability to use the money and also get the work done. And we understand the, the, having that flexibility, council member, and, and we support it. Um, uh, we just wanted to emphasize again that, for example, this year wouldn't be that year simply because we're asked to come up with an additional 200 lane miles of work. And, and I think we can, we're going to be able to do it in-house. But we understand that having that in your, in your pocket is a great uh, form of making sure that the money is spent during the fiscal year. We agree. We'll, we'll talk to BOE about it. Understand? Does that mean we're going to do it? No, we're going to talk to BOE to under fully understand the process because we don't understand the process that well. You yeah, do that, that's right. It. We'll do that. The other one was, and this, and I have no idea what this means, but it shows that BSS uh, indicated they did not use correct infl uh, inflationary rates because Caltrans had not released it. But then the next line in the audit shows. However, the 2006 BSS informed Public Works Committee that the inflationary rate had been released. Do you have any idea how that conflict occurred? I, I recall that, that audit finding that, again, was the increase in the SERF in 2006. Um, to be honest, I didn't fully understand, uh, you know, the, the critique there. Um, can the, I, the can I explain yeah, it? Uh, yes, I please. Explain mm -hmm. it? Please. Uh, fair it's a part. Uh, the index that they used was outdated. It wasn't for the full year. Yeah. They, they used that incorrect rate to compute the 2006 uh, CRF rate. Uh, also, going back to 190, uh, the issue that we brought up is not the collection by PSS, it's the calculation of the rate by PSS. That is the error that we identify in our report. And uh, the numbers they used were overstated, number of cuts were overstated. And there is a clear f council file at the time that they presented to the council that that is for cost recovery, full cost recovery mm -hmm. of the street cuts. There was no partial, there was, there was no discussion of changing behaviors. Uh, that's all documented in the council file at the time they presented. But I think this one was talking about using the Caltrans yeah, this is a subsequent event to that. In 2006, they attempted to update uh, uh, the SDRF. Even at that time, uh, two things they did not take into the consideration, the number of cuts, the trends for the number of cuts, and also using the correct uh, uh, escalation factor. And that resulted in additional $31 million of under collection. The, the other thing, I think one of you spoke earlier about you didn't agree that you're being taken the task about not collecting $190 million. Mm -hmm. What I got out of that item, number five, was not that you didn't collect it, that it was overestimated that you were going to receive it. No, that, that, that number, the $190 million, was based on uh, a full recovery fee. The full recovery fee was never approved. No, no, but they're saying here in the audit that you from the inception, you set in place a figure that would have reflected $190 million coming in when, in fact, you overestimated the number of uh, basically uh, the streets being broken into, and it was far less. You were saying about a million, uh, and, and it came back to under $800,000. I'm going to let Ron answer that question, Councilman. But let me let me let's go back. You know, let's let's get into our time machine and go back to 1998. Um, we were not, as a city, we were we didn't have a comprehensive uh, folder or file of numbers of, of of square footage being trenched. So we took the best information available at that time, and that's what we used to make the projection. I don't know if you want to continue, Councilman. And as I mentioned. Yeah. The time, but I just want to clarify is that I don't think they were criticizing you that you didn't collect 190. What they were saying is that you overestimated what you're going to receive as far as you projecting the revenue coming in. That is, that is, a, that is an issue. 
Yeah, sorry. Let, let, let me put it in another way. So, as Nazario was just talking about, there was an estimate made at the time, and again, we're not the ones issuing the permits for street cuts. We, we, we count on our partners to help us with those estimates. We, we estimate the amount of what was actually happening at that time. The, the square footage of cuts happening at that time translated into a new fee. Once we, again, came up with that number, the fees were based on that estimate. And then as we went in, as I explained before, two, three, four years down the line, and the estimated cuts went down 67% than what was happening at the time or what we originally estimated, that was a good thing. That was a win in our, in our, in our view. There was the incentive for coordinating and mitigating or minimizing those cuts into these new streets um, was successful. Now, we weren't collecting the, the full cost recovery that the controller's office thinks we should have been or that uh, allegedly the council file says that, you know, was the intent. That's not our, our recall. That's not our understanding. It was purely to have a an incentive uh, for coordination, a disincentive, if you will, for cutting into the streets yeah. without... At some point, I thought the department would have determined 190, you were not collecting at a rate of 190 million, and somebody would have said, hey, we over-projected it several years ago. Yeah, Council oh. Member Smith and Zine in 02 and 04 did just that, and that's when we had working groups with those council offices and BOE, we looked at it again, and that's where we came up with the escalator in 2006, again, as a joint group. Um, again, we're being made out to be the sole, um, no, no, the, sole, the sole recommenders of the Caltrans index that's being criticized, but that's what was done at the time and that's what was decided at the time. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is that I would think as a department, if you were estimating revenue at $190 million and it didn't come in at that rate, someone would raise their hand and say, we either overestimated, they're not getting the number of cuts that we thought, something would have happened well in advance of this audit saying you projected $190 million less than that should have been. It shouldn't have been projected that high because you were saying in there that it's going to be like $16 million a year, when in fact it was far below $16 million. Some bail would have gone on somewhere. Uh, we understand, Councilman, and, and perhaps, yeah, the department or all the agencies involved including the CAO, which happens to determine the revenue uh, coming to the city of LA. We all should have been more vigilant, perhaps. But uh, let's not forget that during that time, the economics in the city of LA were going south. And, and a lot of things happened at that time, a lot of unpredictable things, including, you know, um, the construction went down, a permit, number of permits um, uh, went down as well. So um, it was a time perhaps in which I agree with you, perhaps the whole city family should have been more vigilant to determine, hey, we're not getting the revenue that was projected and we should have reacted in a different way perhaps. But in 2002, 2003, uh, Council Member Smith uh, and, um, and, and Council right. Member Zine noticed that precisely and that's when we decided to study this in more detail and adjust the fee. Let me just ask another couple of questions. Is that what does it mean when we say we're using micropaper and it's a beta system? Does that mean it's the first generation? Micropaper no, that, mean, that means that um, I think we're using version 8.5 because we have the publisher of micropaper under contract as a consultant. Sometimes we're able to get advanced versions before they're released to the general customer base. Mm -hmm. So there are times, which we think is a terrific thing, where we've got the new version before the public does. And during the audit was one of those times. And then shortly thereafter, we end up using the same version as, you know, the public catches up to us. So we often get new features that aren't currently available to other customers. Then, then the question, of if, if that is so, then something that is haywire in the audit because their impression of micropaper is that it is, as they say, outdated and it does not give you many features to fully use, be utilized. So you think it's the state of the art and they're giving you advanced copies. Someone on their audit team is saying it is specifically outdated and you don't get nearly the utility that you should. Well, micropaper is not an asset management program. I mean, no, no, perhaps... For what it does. For what it does, it's the state of the art. I mean, it's used by the 
elite municipalities in the nation and by the armed forces and highly recommended by the American Public Works Association. But it's a tool to determine pavement condition of the streets and to determine what kind of work needs to be done on the street. It is a tool and, and we use it as a tool. Let me ask Mr. Galpern, is he still here? No, he left. No. Okay. Mm. Something is, again, maybe you can Mr. James, you can get this reconciled because it, it appears the audit is saying they're using a piece of equipment that's outdated and it doesn't give utility. They're saying it's the state of the art. Yeah, can I, you know, I, can, I, can ex I can explain that there were some features in micropaver uh, that are not being used. Uh, that, is, that, is a, that is a reference. That's a, would that be to our benefit? Yeah, well, system capabilities that are not, not using, they're not functioning the, the way you're supposed to. I know, so that, would it be in our benefit if they yes, were? Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, also, I want to add that uh, micropaper, the mentioned micropaper was supported by audit uh, in previous audit. That was 17 years ago. 17 years ago, we look at it, time has changed. We identify many other systems out there, other jurisdictions who are using different systems. It is listed on page 50 of our report. We have recommendation to consider whether alternative system can give them a, a, a full comprehensive asset management, not only for the streets, for other assets that city has. Right. The capable with a much more capability that micropaper has at this time. Let me give you the last question. I'm just wondering, and one of the comments they made is to looking at the priorities that we set, whether at the end result, I think one of the first, a number one on their first recommendation or finding. They're saying our streets are at really a C minus. That is the average condition of the street network in LA, PCI of 62. The other issue is it says in here in another item, number 12, that a, uh, if we don't fix a street that's crumbling, it costs 63% more to bring it up to B than maintain it. On those two issues, it appears to me that maybe our policy of doing B's and A's and ignoring the other ones are the, more, are more costly down the road. That is correct. Micropaver and best management practices will tell you that if you don't have enough money to improve the D's and F's, you must maintain the A, B's and C's in that condition because F streets will end up costing seven times more than maintaining an A or a B or a C street. If you let it go to an F and they keep dropping the D's and F eventually, how much of that hot streets are going to be 60% more to fix? When a street falls to the category of F, that means that approximately 30% of the, uh, imagine a block in LA, 30% of that block has base failure, right? So best management practices in resurfacing will dictate that you remove not only that 30% of base failure, but the entire length of the block. So if, if you got already an F street with 30% base failure, to repair it is the same thing as if you have a street with 40% of base failure or 50% of base failure. Why? Because in the end, you will have to remove the entire street no matter what. Exactly. Our entire program is based on catching streets in C that are about to start to have base failure before that base failure occurs. And the finding that supports that is that for the last eight years, the PCI has been stabilized at 62. All previous mayors left the road condition in a worse state than the way they received it until the last eight years. And that's because we are no longer allowing additional streets to have base failure. We're resurfacing them in time before that happens. Any other questions? Can I also yeah. make one more clarification? Pilo made a statement that traffic is considered, but they only consider that if there is any funding left. Uh, our recommendation is traffic in the in a heavy area needs to be part of the criteria before any any money is spent, so it's considered in terms of the construction, the surfacing, or slurry. We, it respect it is, but, yeah. we respectfully disagree with that mm -hmm. suggestion because it goes against best practices in pavement management, and here's why. If we don't focus the program on catching C's before they become D's, then we will end up with more residential failed streets. If we don't follow what micropaver tells us to do and use a cost-effectiveness criteria 
and instead we shade the program more towards arterials, then there will be residential streets that we allow to fail that add to the $4 billion backlog that we already have. So we have to get to the point where we've maintained the streets adequately and then fresh money on top right. of that, we could That's certainly fine. focus on our streets. As long as you get to the streets, you haven't repaved in 60 years. All right. Okay, thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you very much. And uh, we have cards on this item, so I'm going to be calling public speakers. Thank you very much to the auditors that were here, Bureau of Street Services. Um, our first uh, card is from Timothy Butcher. Did I get that right? You want to come forward, sir? Thank you, Madam Chair. Go ahead. Uh, I work for Street Services. I'm a heavy truck operator. Uh, many of you know me. I work with the union. Um, been very active with uh, with labor issues. And I will say these these men that are, are sitting behind me, being in management, we've not always seen eye to eye. Obviously, there are things day to day that come up that are problematic. But the things they're talking about today. I can wholeheartedly support each of the points they're, they're making here today. The, these are very important, if sometimes difficult to understand points. Um, let me speak to the asphalt plant. Uh, I actually am assigned to the asphalt plant, asphalt plant one, and every other aspect of what we do in resurfacing, I've, I've been working with the city since the 90s. Uh, we are state of the art high-tech and we are able to do more with less every day and the glaring exception to that is the asphalt plant um, that is a priority that needs to be rebuilt that needs that needs to happen um, from my understanding I'm not as knowledgeable as, as these men but my understanding of the micropaver system uh, is that in fact it is state-of-the-art for resurfacing streets. Now perhaps the controller needs some other system that, that helps with managing money and other aspects of city functions, but as far as fixing the streets and maintaining the streets, micropaver is, is the best tool that's out there. Um, controller Galperin used the term triage in our bureau, and uh, I think that's an accurate characterization. Uh, having said that, I guess I am a member of the walking wounded. Uh, we have been asked to do so much with so little now, and I take pride that our our bureau is can do. We are can do bureau, and if you allow us, we can and will do whatever you ask. Thank you, Mr. Butcher. Um, next speaker, Herman. Uh, Madam Speaker, I prefer you call me Mr. Herman. Your constituent. Your name on here is Herman, so that's what I'm going to refer well, you to. Well, Madam Speaker, as you understand that there is a desperate repair for infrastructure for our safer streets. And if Mr. Salcido and his groupie crew here cannot figure out a better way to maintain our streets within 30 years, the Department of Justice is going to come down hard on you because, as you heard, under the Wolves versus Los Angeles, we the disabled have gained $1.4 billion to determine that the city of Los Angeles failed, failed, failed to provide us safe streets, access to our streets, by the most important obligation you have, which is to maintain streets and sidewalks. But because the issue here has to do with resurfacing, the infrastructure of resurfacing has to do with repairs. Now, if you alter a, a street by repairing just a patch-up hole and gutting the budget out of millions of dollars, which could really fix the street, fix the issue, and obligate the city of Los Angeles to take full accountability to fix the street, we wouldn't have this problem. But instead, you rather not follow the case Barden versus Sacramento when you alter one side of a street to do repairs again you're obligated to repair all access because this is your obligation we the taxpayers pay enough in taxes to have our streets slurry sealed 
resurface, but yet some of these departments cover the goddamn gutters for the water to flow. And that's why there's a problem with dirty, contaminated grounds. Stop slurry sewing on top of the gutters, you wouldn't have this infrastructure problem. But now the curbs are damaged, the curb ramps are damaged, now fix our sidewalks and streets within 30 years. Wayne Spindler. We got a, a great thing when Gallup run one over that big fat douchebag design. And this is the reason I think they spent so much money trying to defeat Galperin, because the guy digs in and he tries to think outside the union box and outside the campaign donor box. So you've been doing this wrong for a hundred years. Listen to the guy. Take his recommendations. Give it a shot. What the hell can you lose? I mean, he can only run for two terms, if the people are smart, they'll make a mayor next time. But um, this this man has been been an absolute guiding light, this Galper. And I'll tell you, you know, I mean, he he brings things to light that there's ways to do this. Now, why is it I can go to Home Depot and buy a whole bag of cement where you just pour the crap in the hole and you add water to it, and the shit lasts 35 years, and yet you guys are going, I can't fill a pothole because it has a D minus. It may be dangerous. Please. It's not, can we do it? It's, let's get it done, do it. Just get the hell out there and fix it. They have streets. Start in the areas. You know the areas. South Central. You know the areas, the alleys, which, by the way, uh, the Public Works said that alleys cannot be repaired because it's not covered by federal matching funds. So alleys are even a, a bigger disgrace. You want to drive three trucks to, to remove all the trash on 100-year-old alleys and you never provided funding for that. So give Galperin everything he recommends, just do it! Because the guy's eight times smarter than everybody in this room put together. Thank you. Madam Clerk, I have no more cards on this item, so if there's no objections, I'd like to move to note and file the audit. See none? We're I'm sorry? We are getting a report back on the recommendations on each of the findings, correct? Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parks, for that reminder. So we've uh, voted on item one. Uh, yes, um, so what you're doing is you, you're going to note and file the report and you're asking for a report back. Correct. On well, I'm sorry. We're asking for you, you Mr. Parks, you wanted. I thought they were going to report back on. On a separate item. On the recommendations, on the findings. There's several that have been disputed and have not been implemented. Okay. There's three of them that have not been implemented. Okay, traditionally, my understanding is that they submit the findings to the controller and then the controller submits those findings to the audits committee. Is that correct? Okay, so then we will ask the controller's office for the report. Thank you very much. Okay. That concludes item one. We have to go back to item two, colleagues, because we have two cards that were submitted. Herman, followed by Wayne Spindler. Great. I'm glad that Mr. Bloomfield didn't sit in today, and Joe Buscano cut out early so he can beat the traffic back to Long Beach. But this is the problem and point. Housing and Community Investment Department. Whew. Contract the amendment to the O'Connell LLP to allow the city to pay for two additional audits. Really. Like if Ron Calprin couldn't produce us with just one required audit, we wouldn't have to be funding additional administrative waste to these projects that you're talking about here, Housing and Community Investment Department. But yet the financial impact statement was submitted, and it says yes, 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 like you tabulate the vote and it's always yes, no disagreement, no challenge, just invest, invest, invest on the taxpayer's back 
all the poor taxpayers of Los Angeles who sweat their ass off to make a buck and have a house and a white picket fence. Yes. So, why do I always say yes? Because sometimes I'm right. When it comes to the relative contract amendments that Macias, Genie, and O'Connell, LLP to allow the city to pay for two audits, you see? It's so simple. If you just did one audit, you could save the taxpayers plenty of money, and you can delegate, administrate all this extra money to repair our sidewalks and streets, and maybe even fix the alleys, instead of driving your 40 tons of trucks through them and destroying them. So I'm going to take up too much time. It's almost 5 o'clock, and I want to comment on public comment. I want to thank you, Mr. Price, for taking consideration to stay with us all night. You, Ms. Martinez, you, Mr. Parks, and the ladies and the gentlemen who sit here laughing with us, because we have a great day here in the city of Hall. It's my favorite home, and I thank you for giving me this position. Thank you. Thank you very Good much. Good night. William Spindler? You're speaking on item two? Uh, yes. Um, I think we have a controller's office, and I think they have a budget in the tens of millions of dollars, and I think that audits can be conducted by the controller. So why are we giving outside contracts to somebody that we already pay to do this job that is more than capable of doing it? That's called waste. Let's take the money, I know, Macias, Genie, and O'Connell, LLP, Limited Liability Partnership. See, I know what LLP means. How does a bum like me know what LLP means? I mean, I got a hole in my goddamn jacket. How do I know that? Because the reason I know what an LLP is is because it's a campaign donor. So what, what, what did you do? Did you look in the yellow pages and go, I need an audit, um, hello 411, I need an audit for the Housing and Community Investment Department. Yes, one second. Um, what's your area code? 213, okay. Um, under M we have Macias, Genie, and O'Connell, okay. And that's how you found them, right? You just called up information and you found them, right? Or did they contribute to campaigns? Oh, they must be a campaign donor. So now we have to give our friends that donate to the city family a contract. How much is this going to cost us? Nobody cares. In fact, they might do it for free. Maybe it's a free audit. But we need two because you can't do it in one. That's not enough overbilling. You can't overbill on one contract. You've got to overbill on two contracts so that you can play golf at 7 a.m., do the audit, and then get billed double overtime while you play the round before 8 o'clock. That's the way it's done. Madam Clerk, this concludes the cards for item 2, and we had voted on that item earlier. Yes, uh, I have three cards uh, for public comment. General public comment, Mr. Walsh? Is he here? He left. Okay, thank you. Wayne Spindler, followed by Herman. We, we talk about roads. Let's start with the one that has broken my car in part more than any other road. Burbank off of Sepulveda, off the 405. Going back to the Jews, westbound. So in other words, you go off the 405, and then you turn off the freeway, and you turn your blinker left, and then you turn left to go west on Burbank, and then as you're proceeding towards the Jews and the golf courses, you break your car on this hump of pavement there. And despite all the times I call the council offices, I find out it's under CD6. Somebody named Mary Martinez is the one that's in charge of it, and yet it never gets paved. It never gets paid. Tony Cardenas, he spent eight years trying to find out where the intersection is. I mean, he goes, well, where is the intersection? And I'm like, it's over by the fucking freeway. Do you have an address? No. Well, if without an address, I cannot do this. So I'm telling you where it is. All you got to do is drive off of the 405 turn, break the front of your car, and that's where the road is broken on, on, on Burbank Boulevard off of the 405. 
Why the hell isn't it being fixed? It is a traffic hazard. It is a safety hazard. It is breaking apart buses. It is breaking apart city trucks. It is, part, it is, it is damaging hundreds of thousands of cars. The next time I hit that thing, I'm going to sue the city. The, I'm telling you right now where it is. The next time I go over that damn thing I'm, and I break another part of my car, I'm suing the city for a claim. And you're going to, fi you're going to fix the whole car. Now, I'm going in the shop Friday. I'm going on the freeway in the next two days. So let's see a crew out there. Dig it up. It's an F minus, and let's fix it. And that can be the very first street that's an F to ever be fixed in the San Fernando Valley in 88 years. Well, folks, I'm back. Four billion short to fix our streets. And what is considered a public accommodation? Bars, serving food and drinks. And what about our desperate repairs for streets? What about the maintenance, the ongoing obligations to achieve the goal of securing that the elderly, the disabled have safe sidewalk and streets? That's why the Olympians are not coming here. But the special Olympians are here because you do a great donkey show to tell us that we're, we have safe sidewalk and streets when we actually don't. I love L.A. I love it so much that I get a thrill coming into City Hall to protest for access to all areas, access to where goods and services are offered, access to public restrooms, entrance access, to cross the street to my Staples Centers to see the Clippers tonight. And again, Title II, Title III, no responsibility by the city of Los Angeles, no obligation. But again, who will determine that? The judges of the state of California. For Wolves versus LA, Barden versus Sacramento, and you, Mr. Salcido, talking about your BSSA audit. I call it B for bull, S for shit. The other part is service, because I'm denied access and service to walk safely on the streets of Los Angeles, slipping in potholes, falling over root stumps that grow in the streets. Come to Boyle Heights and see how bad they are because of the bad influence of our drunken councilman, Jose Huizar, who likes to have sexual relationships and says he's not married. Really? That's like saying you don't have a budget to fix our sidewalk and streets, Huizar, you loser. Fix our sidewalks and streets. Madam Clerk, that concludes public comments. I see no other cards on file. So I want to move that this meeting, uh, the meeting, joint meeting of the Audits and Public Works Committee is adjourned. Thank you very much. Thank you.